Nazi Methods of Control, Government and Opposition, Podcast 5, Other Opposition. Returning to the same mind map that we've used uh, for the previous four podcasts, so again just a reminder of the big picture, if you get a question in the exam about how the Nazis controlled the German people, um, you need to you need to look at the different strands. Uh, so you have, first of all, the Cult of Führer, which we covered in Podcast 1. Terror, which we covered in Podcast 2. Propaganda, which we covered in the third podcast. And the last one we looked at, Religion. So in this one, we're going to be looking at the final strand, which is Youth, and in particular, the Army. Uh, so, I think there's something just to point out at the outset. Um, you will remember that when we looked at, uh, for example, uh, religious op- uh, opposition groups, uh, what, one of the themes that, sort of, that came through was that in the early years, 1933 to 36, uh, the first few years after Hitler became Chancellor, Hitler, like a wolf, in sheep's clothing, concealed his true long-term aims from the German people. So there was very little or no mention really about um, wanting to go to war for living space with Russia. Um, Everything was very much presented as he was a reasonable politician who just simply wanted to create unity, to create jobs, to get Germany back on a strong footing. And so many people supported um, Hitler and the Nazis, not realising where he eventually wanted to take Germany. That was certainly the case with the priests, um, who fairly quickly began to realise what the Nazis were when Hitler started to reveal his true colours. This is true with both the groups that are going to form part of this this, um, final podcast, the young people and the army, very, very similar pictures. So starting off with the young people, early days... The um, very popular with most young people, many, many young people. Um, but from the mid-1930s, say 1936 to 1937 onwards, many young people were becoming disenchanted with Nazi policies. The Hitler Youth in particular uh, was becoming more like a military boot camp, um, less fun than it used to be in the early years. Um, very much about preparing young people to become soldiers. So increasingly young people began to rebel um, against the Nazis. And the most famous group of young people um, who rebelled were called the Edelweiss Pirates. Um, They rebelled as typical teenagers do even today. They simply refused to conform. So rather than join the Hitler Youth, they went off into the countryside themselves and just did their own thing um, rather than listen to the type of music that the Nazis expected young people to listen to which was very uh, Germanic music they would listen to American jazz which of course the Nazis hated because American jazz they saw as the music of of black musicians a a, a racial untermension Uh, uh, blacks were seen to be um, subhumans Um, these young people, the Edelweiss pirates, um, would go out at night and write graffiti on walls, anti-Nazi graffiti. And once the war broke out, they would they even actively joined resistance movements. Um, uh, would sabotage, would um, uh, would destroy Nazi property um, to slow down the Nazi war effort. Another group. Um, who uh, were very prominent uh, during World War II um, were the White Rose Group. Now, these were a group of university students led by two students, Hans and Sophie Scholl, and you can see them in the photograph here, um, working with one of their university professors at Munich University. university. Um, they, at great risk to their lives, and knowing that, and knowing that they would be caught eventually, Um, produced leaflets and distributed the leaflets. They had heard rumours about the awful things that were happening in Poland, um, 
we will look at this in a, in a later revision session, but when Hitler started to mass murder Jews during World War II, he did it in Poland for one reason, was he wanted to conceal what he was doing from the German people. He didn't want the German people to know about that. But inevitably, rumours um, crept through. Soldiers coming back from the front, back to Germany, would have heard or seen what was happening, and they spoke to their, their wives about it. So there were rumours about what was happening, and Hans and Sophie Scholl decided to put pen to paper and print off lots of leaflets telling the German people about what was happening and urging the German people not to support the war effort. Well, inevitably, the Gestapo caught them in February 1943. And both Hans and Sophie Scholl and Professor Huber were executed. They were decapitated um, for their resistance movement. They knew that was going to, ha going to happen, but they did it um, for that very reason. They wanted, the, the, they wanted future generations, us today, um, 50 years later, to realise that there were good Germans. Not all Germans were supporters of the Nazis. Uh, so it is important that we remember the Scholls, um, very, very important groups. So the White Rose Group, the Edelweiss Pirates, uh, were important. They were young people um, who, even though most young people uh, either passively or actively supported the Nazis, um, there were some young people in Germany who were prepared to resist the Nazi movement. The army then. Now the army, uh, if you remember, what, what a very, very important thing to understand at the beginning, the, the German army were not Nazi. The German army were supporters of the Nazis in 1933. The German army was an ancient and, or a very old and proud institution. Um, very, very proud. Uh, an upper class leadership, the generals, very proud of the country that they had created. Um, in 1871, Germany came into existence, created by the German army, and the German army leadership admired Hitler in the early days. That's one of the reasons, if you remember, that the German army um, helped support Hitler into power. And then when Hitler dealt with the problem of the SA, the army, you remember, swore an oath of loyalty to Hitler. But like many of these groups, they did not realise that Hitler was eventually planning a war of expansion against Russia. But they were trapped by that oath. And so once World War II started, and in a sense because the war was so successful in the early years with the Germans defeating Poland and then France and Belgium and Holland and Denmark and Norway, the army was swept away by the victory. But then the war turned against Germany from 1942 onwards and then senior army leaders began to have doubts. They realised, they, they began to witness what Hitler was doing in Poland with the Jews, and there were some brave army leaders, men of principle, who were prepared to break the oath that they had sworn to Hitler and make that decision that they wanted to remove him. Now, the most famous plot, um, it happened on the 20th of July, 1944, and it was called Operation Valkyrie. Just writing that there for you. And it was organised by this man, Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, a very, very brave man. It was an extensive plot. Oh, I've just seen the word there, it's on the slideshow. I needn't have written it for you. Um, it was a very, very extensive plot. It started <coughs> with the essential thing that Hitler must be killed. Um, and so it was worked out that um, they would put a bomb in a briefcase beneath the, ta beneath the table that Hitler was sitting at and Stauffenberg would be one of the soldiers at that meeting. Um, it was arranged so that a telephone call would withdraw Stauffenberg from the room and while Hit uh, and, and that is indeed what happened. Stauffenberg left the room, jumped into a jeep um, drove away from the building. As he left the building, the building behind him exploded. Um, phone calls were made. The army put into effect the next stage, which was to start arresting SS officers 
um, in various cities around Europe, like Berlin and Paris, um, and the plot was well underway, and it could very well have succeeded. But then suddenly, that very evening, the radio on the radio, Hitler's voice was heard. He had survived the explosion by a, a miracle, and Hitler denounced the plotters and called upon Germans to turn against the plotters. Um, caught in confusion as to what to do next, um, the plotters were arrested by the SS. Um, Stauffenberg was shot on the spot, and over 5,500 um, people who were involved in that plot were executed by the Nazis over the next few months. So Operation Valkyrie failed. The it was that that plot was one of the is a good example though of of how there were men of. Um, of, of moral strength in Germany who were prepared even at this stage to try to remove Hitler. Uh, there was no other plot to remove Hitler after that. Um, uh, Hitler um, publicly filmed um, the execution of many of the plotters and played the film uh, to the German army as a clear message, this is what will happen to you if there are any further plots um, against Hitler. Okay, so that's that final topic. Uh, we have uh, a few questions, a few uh, factual questions there, so have a quick go at those, and then pause it while you do that, and then replay the podcast, one slide remaining, which gives you the answers. So there are the answers to the question. The final, the sixth podcast in this series of podcasts about Nazi methods of control uh, we'll look at a typical essay question, so that will be podcast number six.